Hello. In this video, we are going to use simple Huckel theory to derive the molecular orbital coefficients for the pi system of the allylic cation. Here is a quick sketch of the allylic cation, or at least one of two possible resonance forms. We can have the double bond between this carbon and that carbon, or between this carbon and that carbon. So effectively, rather than having a double bond and a single bond, because of resonance, we have delocalization of the pi system over all three carbons. For later ease of reference, we number the carbons with the green number, carbon 1, 2, and carbon 3. For the sake of brevity, this video is going to assume that you've already seen the previous video showing how to set up the secular determinants for this particular system in the simple Huckel theory and how to derive the eigenvalues. If you have not seen that video, you can find it right here. The secular determinant equation that we eventually solved is shown here for reference, where we have to solve this 3 by 3 determinant under the condition that it is equal to 0. There are three values of x for which this particular equation is true, as we found in the previous video, and those values of x are 0, the square root of 2, and minus the square root of 2. And we are able from that to interpret the approximate energies of the molecular orbitals in the allylic pi system. What we want to demonstrate now is how to use this information to get a visual representation of the molecular orbitals, particularly to find the weights of each particular that's P, that's atomic orbital in the molecular orbital. To find the molecular coefficients, we have to make use of this enlarged version of our secular determinant equation here. This is actually a matrix equation. And if you are familiar with the principles of linear algebra, ultimately these values of x are the eigenvalues of this particular matrix. And we're trying to determine the eigenvectors. And in this specific step here, since we're trying to find the values of C1, C2, and C3, so that if we multiply by the matrix, we get the zero vector, we're ultimately trying to find a basis for the null space of the matrix. In my derivation, I'm going to try to use as little linear algebra as possible and demonstrate how we can find the solution using only the algebra that you would have learned in high school. To find the coefficients, we have to proceed in three steps. Essentially, we're going to take the values of x, 0, square root of 2, and minus the square root of 2, individually, one at a time. And for each case, we're going to find particular molecular orbital coefficients that correspond to that particular uh, energy. So the first we're going to use is the case where x is equal to 0. So we remind ourselves of the general equation. And then we're going to write down here the specific equation substituting uh, 0 for x in the equation. So here we have the actual matrix equation that we're going to solve for the case where x is equal to 0. What we're going to see is we can write this expression down in a form more familiar uh, system of linear equations. I wrote out the resulting system of linear equations uh, in a very extensive way for any students who may not be familiar with matrix multiplication, but we can simply use this matrix as the coefficients of C1 for the first column, C2 for the second column, and C3 for the third column. This is the first equation, this is the second equation, 
and here it's a third equation. So this is the system of equations that we get, and then the right-hand side are all of these zeros. So this is the system of linear equations we want to solve for the case where x is equal to zero. We notice that the first equation and the third equation are identical. Because they are identical, uh, the third equation doesn't give us any new information, so we can simply ignore it from now on. And that reduces our problem to a system of two equations. We can immediately simplify equation number one with the result that we get c2 is equal to zero. And this has the benefit that now we know the value of the coefficient c2 for the first case. And we're left with our final equation, equation number two, which we can again rewrite in a simplified form. And we have simplifying that c1 plus c3 is equal to zero. So we can subtract c3 from each side. And this gives us that c3 is equal to c1. For the time being, we can select an arbitrary value for c1. So let's take the easiest possible value and call it the number one. We've already found that c2 is equal to zero. And that c3 is minus c1, so that gives us minus one. So that tells us in the molecular orbital that corresponds to the eigenvalue x is equal to zero, the coefficient for the p orbital for the first carbon is a one, the coefficient for the p orbital for the second carbon is a zero, and the coefficient for the uh, p orbital in the third carbon is going to be a minus one. Now typically, because we picked an arbitrary combination of values for C1, uh, we could have an infinite number of combinations of coefficients. To reduce this to a unique set, we perform a procedure called normalization. And the key feature of normalization is that if we square the orbital, we get the value of one. And the reason for doing this is so that we can interpret uh, the weights of orbitals as probabilities. In this particular case, we first compute the value n squared, which is just the square of each of the coefficients individually. We notice that c1 is equal to one, c3 is equal to minus one, and that c2 was equal to zero. So if I have one squared plus zero squared plus minus one squared, I get a value that n squared is equal to two. What we do with this n squared value is as follows, is we take the square root of it, and then we divide each of our coefficients by the square root of this number. So we have one divided by the square root of two. This is our new normalized coefficient. We have zero divided by the square root of two, but that's still zero. And we have minus one divided by the square root of, of two. So now that we have for the uh, eigenvalue x is equal to zero, we actually have the normalized molecular orbital coefficients. Second, we are going to work with the eigenvalue x equals the square root of two. So we take our previous uh, secular determinant uh, matrix equation and we replace the x's that were along the diagonal with the eigenvalue square root of two. And we want to solve for C1, C2, and C3 such that this system of equations is true. And again, we get a system of three equations in three unknowns, where our three unknowns are the molecular orbital coefficients, C1, C2, and C3. This time, anytime I had a coefficient of zero, I just left it out to make it clear. So we have the following three equations. And one thing we notice is that we have one C2 in equation number one and in equation number three. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the entirety of equation three and subtract it from equation one. So since you can have equation one minus equation three. Subtracting equation one minus equation three 
has the advantage of eliminating the variable C2. So now we get an equation in two unknowns, and we have the square root of C2, square root of 2 times C1 minus the square root of 2 times C3 is equal to 0. And we can simply add a square root of 2 to C3 to each side and then divide by the square root of 2 to get that C1 is equal to C3. We can again make use of equation 1, that the square root of 2 times C1 plus C2 is equal to 0. And now we're going to simplify and solve for C2. Equation 1 is that the square root of 2 times C1 plus C2 is equal to 0. We simply subtract square root of 2 C1 from each side, and we've solved for C2, which is going to be minus the square root of 2 times C1. So now we have expressions for C1, C3, and C2. What we can do is assign an arbitrary value for C1, and the easiest arbitrary value to assign uh, is the number 1. Once we have assigned a value to C1, we use those values to determine C2, which is going to be minus square root of 2, and C3 is going to be a value of 1. We have a valid set of molecular orbital coefficients, but these are not yet normalized. So now we have to perform our normalization procedure on this to get a normalized set of coefficients. So in our procedure, we take each of our current coefficients, we square them and add them together, keeping the fact that this is minus the square root of 2, but when we square it, we're going to get a positive 2. So we get 1 plus 2 plus 1 gives us a value of 4. So we recall, what we do with this number is, we take its square root and then we divide each of these coefficients by this particular square root to get the normalized coefficients. So that gives us that the normalized coefficients are now going to be, since the square root of 4 is 2, we have 1 half minus the square root of 2 over 2 and so these are now our normalized coefficients for the pi molecular orbital corresponding to the eigenvalue x equals the square root of 2. For the third and final step, we are going to examine the case where the eigenvalue x is equal to minus the square root of 2. So we notice that we get a matrix equation that looks very similar to the case where x was equal to a positive square root of 2, but now we have a minus square root of 2 along the diagonal. Again, we're going to expand this as a system of linear equations and then find the appropriate values of c1, c2, and c3 that make the system true. So we get the system of equations that minus the square root of 2 c1 plus c2 is equal to 0, which we get from here. We get that c1 minus the square root of 2 plus c3 is equal to 0, which we get from there. And that c2, there's no c1 value because of the 0. So we have c2 minus the square root of 2 c3 is again equal to 0. And to solve, since it was so successful last time, we noticed that we had subtracted equation 1 minus equation 3. And in the process, we were able to eliminate c2. And that will again be the method that we're going to apply. When we subtract equation 3 from equation 1, we get minus the square root of 2 c1 plus the square root of 2 times c3 is equal to 0. Again, we can add the square root of 2 c1 to each side, divide by the square root of 2, and we get very quickly that c1 is equal to c3. To determine C2, again, we can go back to equation 1, and we have that minus the square root of 2 C1 plus C2 is equal to 0, and now we can add the square root of 2 C1 to each side. And we get that now C2 is equal to the square root of 2 times C1. To put numbers in place of our variables, let's arbitrarily assign the value of 1 to C1, that will give us that C3 is also equal to a value of 1. 
And then since C2 is the square root of 2 times C1, C2 will now be the square root of 2. So our unnormalized set of coefficients now will be 1, square root of 2, and 1. To get a normalized set, we find our value n squared. And recall to get n squared, we just take each of the coefficients and square it and add them together. So this is 1 squared plus the square root of 2 squared plus 1 squared, which gives us a total value of 4. And what we do now with this particular value is we take its square root and then we divide each of these coefficients by the square root of this number. So that gives us our final set as 1 over 2, because 2 is the square root of 4. The square root of 2 over 2, we took that divided by the square root of 2, and now 1 divided by 2. So our final set of coefficients gives us C1 equals a half, C2 equals the positive square root of 2 over 2, and C3 is equal to 1 half. I thank you very much for your attention. As always, have a good one.